it's, it's supposed to be next month and I was hoping to do a little bit more kind of local work with the refugee population and the immigrant population in Chicago. So for my education project, I've worked with um, my mentor, Kristen Van Gandren, um, in regards to um, coming up with education mod modules as part of a bigger initiative that is called IPAC, or Immigrant Partnership and Advocacy Curricular Kit. Um, sorry, you can go to the next slide. Um, but so the IPAC initiative, so in the US, um, the latest statistics in the American Academy of Pediatrics, it shows that about one in four children or approximately 18.4 million in total live in an immigrant family, which is defined as either the child is born outside of the United States or they live within a family household or at least one of the um, parents is um, from out of the or from a foreign country. And um, we know that this is um, rapidly changing as well as um, you know, the latest in terms of um, changes in the borders. And so there's an increasing interest in both immigrant and refugee health among pediatric educators and trainees. Um, but even though there's a lot of interest, a lot of clinicians, so especially like um, new clinicians as in residents, were kind of unsure on how to um, navigate the different routes. And so I specifically worked um, with Kristen, Anisha, and Kala on the advocacy um, side of the initiative. So stepping back a little bit, the IPAC initiative, it actually has eight different domains that kind of, we split up into different modules and workshops and it ranges from just a brief overview of the arrival process and kind of goes through um, the different um, aspects and the unique kind of health risks that this population has based on either exposures or even their immunization his, uh, status but also kind of unique stressors in terms of their access to healthcare, different socioeconomic factors, as well as kind of psychological um, unique stressors as well. So to kind of address all that, we split it into eight different modules, um, again, ranging from the ethical to the medical legal um, and partnership building. Um, and so our module is specifically um, looking at advocacy and action. So, um, you can, um, so the IPAC initiative was developed to kind of implement a modifiable curriculum that can help equip trainees to positively interact with this vulnerable community. And so Sarah, if you go to the next slide, um, the advocacy and action module itself, we had specific learning objectives in terms of trying to identify opportunities for advocacy of um, immigrant and refugee uh, populations, kind of at the different stages or levels, um, starting with individual level and then the community level and then finally the state and federal advocacy level um, and so from an individual level we kind of focus on um, practices that all of us as clinicians can utilize um, particularly focusing on the use of interpreters and interpreter best practices um, and then we kind of broadened it to um, the community in terms of learning how to do stakeholder policy mapping and then finally in terms of the um, state and federal level kind of taking more to um, either like social media, news media, um, and then letter writing or kind of reaching out to your representative and doing kind of more of a formal curriculum to help kind of guide clinicians who are new to all of this. Um, so I can go to the next slide. So um, our module um, is a case-based kind of interactive module that follows um, the story of Miguel, who is a seven-year-old patient that you're seeing for the first time in clinic. Um, and once you them for the first time in his family you kind of quickly realize that they're Spanish speaking only and so um, because of time limits I'm only going to kind of go broadly over um, the highlights of our module I didn't we don't have time to kind of go through all of the different activities um, and so I just want to focus especially on this individual level because like I said it kind of applies to all of us as clinicians and kind of being reminded of you know why we always want to use interpreters when interacting with this uh, population so about 57 million people, or about 20% of the U.S. population, um, speak another language other than English at home. And within that cohort, about um, 25 million, or a total of 8.6% of the U.S. population, um, identify as limited English proficiency. And there's a lot of research that shows that these patients have greater healthcare risks and kind of lower overall quality of care for several different reasons. And this can play out as um, longer hospital stays, um, greater risk um, with certain things like light infections, and then overall together, just kind of a greater use of resources from a public health uh, perspective. 
And so, Sarah, if you go to the next slide, this is just kind of an excerpt um, from one of our activities. So in all of our different activities, we split it up as kind of an overview and then a facilitator and then a learner's kind of um, copy of the um, activities. And so this is just to kind of visually show you um, just excerpts of the um, different things that we cover in the module. If you go to the next slide, um, let's say that um, you are using an interpreter, you want to use an interpreter with Miguel, but you realize that your clinic practice or your hospital-based practice actually doesn't have the um, resource of using interpreters. And so you kind of want to advocate at a community level and try to figure out what is the best route to kind of um, bring that resource to this community. And so for that activity, we um, focus more on um, doing a stakeholder map activity. And so it kind of goes through, um, Sarah, if you go to the next slide, um, kind of the key components of doing a stakeholder map. So um, defining your ask um, or defining the issue. And then um, with that kind of identifying different potential stakeholders and then determining the levers of influence. Um, and then it's just kind of an interactive group activity um, that can be used specifically with our module for interpreters or if your group has, already has a specific um, issue in mind, then you can kind of develop it or modify it as you see fit. Um, Moving on to the next slide, um, case continued. Um, you learned that Miguel was born in Venezuela and recently um, came to the United States. And so as refugees, um, what public health, um, what public benefits or healthcare benefits are um, available? And so if you go to the next slide, a lot of the modules is just kind of um, having up-to-date references um, for clinicians that are kind of easy to access and easy to use just because it's just not readily available for a lot of clinicians. Um, and then just very briefly, because I know I'm running out of time on the state and federal level, just a kind of um, glimpse at the other activities that we really go into is um, social media advocacy in today's world, op-ed writing, as well as reaching out to your representative. Um, and uh, Sarah, if you move on to the next slide, I think actually a couple slides. Um, so all together, um, as the um, IPAC initiative, so I forgot to mention that it is in conjunction with the Midwest Consortium of um, Global Child Health Educators. Um, all together, we have come up with these different modules and we submitted it to um, a few different conferences because our original intent was to um, kind of launch it as a workshop dedicated particularly to program directors and associate program directors to kind of give them this um, free resource of uh, a curriculum that they can modify for different levels of training. So either medical students or residents um, or even um, just clinicians who are more interested in kind of getting um, more involved. And so we have been accepted to um, a couple of different conferences. Unfortunately, the APPD and the um, PAS conferences have been canceled because of COVID, but we're hoping that in the fall, um, we've been accepted to present at the AAP conference and we're hoping to kind of get it launched there with the goal of um, the trainees of our uh, curriculum can bring it back to their home institution and kind of implement it into practice as they see fit. Um, I think I am out of time now, but if you go to the next slide, it's just briefly some of the references. Um, and then lastly, in the last slide, just some acknowledgements. I just want to say a special thank you to my mentor, Dr. Van Genderen, as well as um, the rest of our collaborators um, within the Midwest Consortium. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. That was great. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box. Um, do you guys have any, but I had just one quick question. Do you have any plans for how to evaluate this as people are using it or how to kind of improve it as you get feedback from um, folks that are using it in kind of their actual practice? Sorry, can you hear, can you hear me now? Um, so uh, formally, we don't have any kind of surveys or, oops, sorry, any surveys or any kind of formal evaluation in place. I think it's gonna be very helpful as we launch this, particularly at like the AAP conference to kind of get feedback um, and see how, like what the interest is and how they think that they can bring this back to um, their different institutions. I think it's a little difficult because like I said, our purpose is to try to make it as kind of modifiable as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, we're trying to just get like a framework and kind of really um, give people the tools to take off in whatever direction they want. But I do think it would be very helpful to at least do some sort of um, like formal evaluation with either surveys or of that sort um, of the um, clinicians as well as even possibly like you can even extend it to like pre and post like in your clinic um, if you work with a specific population, yeah. seeing if there's any noticeable changes or um, 
like improvements in terms of their perception of their care. Awesome. And then just one quick question, then we'll wrap up. Um, one of the judges had a question of if you've been able to pilot the module yet. Um, so formally, no. Uh, we have kind of um, gathered all of the different modules and we publish it and we've um, sent it off to different um, conferences. But again, unfortunately, because of the current situation, we haven't been able to kind of formally pilot it in a workshop. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Angela. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. And I did want to just mention, uh, we will be the posters, unfortunately, we're going to have to quickly move through um, during these slides, but we will be sharing them later on our website if you wanted to look at them more in depth. So next up, we are going to be hearing from John Feister. Hi. Um, so I'm a third year pediatric resident at Lurie. I'm going to be starting a neonatology fellowship here in a couple of months. Um, my global health experience was in, in Mwanza, Tanzania, Bugando Medical Center. Unfortunately, it was cut short due to uh, COVID, but I did get uh, to spend about a week there. Um, and what came of my uh, scholarly project was the idea of creating a simulation of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. Um, this came about after... Um, a bit of an informal needs assessment discussion with providers at Pugando Medical Center. And then also um, Dr. Fant uh, works with a, a hospital in Kenya that had also expressed some interest in development of a sim. Um, so you can go to the next slide. All right, so in terms of background for this, so <clears throat> prematurity complications are one of the leading causes of neonatal, neonatal mortality worldwide. Um, and the incidence of preterm birth is about 12% in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, according to some studies in Tanzania, as high as 16%, so a pretty significant disease burden. Um, <clears throat> when you look at causes of, of uh, mortality related to preterm birth, uh, respiratory distress syndrome is a major driver of that. Um, in terms of how this sim was it specifically applies to Buganda, it, it's a tertiary referral center in uh, northwest region of Tanzania. So they get a lot of outborn babies that are transferred to them um, for respiratory distress, um, and they are responsible for stabilization um, and uh, workup for, for that. So this sim was targeted uh, to kind of fit within the re resources and environment of Bugando. So they have um, a handful of ventilators um, and they do have a, 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 a decent sized NICU that has about 10 to 12 beds uh, with access to bubble CPAP and they can administer surfactant. Um, so this, this was designed with those resources in mind, kind of a resource limited um, simulation. Next slide. All right, so our objective was uh, kind of as, as previously stated, uh, a, targeted, a targeted low fidelity simulation for an outborn baby transferred for respiratory distress to BMC. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of how we went about creating this, uh, so we, I had a brief period um, at Bugando where I was able to observe the NICU and see what resources were available, what, um, types of patients they routinely saw, and then kind of um, briefly was able to, to talk with some of the providers about how they approached um, treating RDS in their population. Um, and then in terms of creating the specific uh, guidelines for the SIM, um, we use the European consensus guidelines for treatment of RDS, and in addition to the WHO pocketbook, um, there aren't, uh, unfortunately, a lot of targeted guidelines for resource limited settings and treatment of RDS that, that we could find. So we kind of tried to meld those two resources in addition to our personal experience at Bugando. Next slide, please. Um, and just to give an overview of, of what I say when this is a low fidelity simulation, the idea being that, you know, this sim can be done with really just a small amount of resources and, and it's targeted for resources that are already at the, the medical center themselves. So things that won't be needed to be purchased or transported over, over to Tanzania in order for them to, to conduct this sim. So one of the things um, that we use is, is called Neonatalie. This is a, 
a mannequin um, that's reasonably um, reasonably realistic uh, when we use it a lot for our helping babies breathe simulation um, and it c could uh, easily be transferred over to this particular RDS simulation. Um, the key points that I would just point out here is that um, it is it is able to be bag masked, ventilated, and you are also able to independently control um, its breathing pattern using kind of a, a self-inflating ball that hooks up to a kind of a lung system. Next slide, please. Uh, just a you know run-of-the-mill pulse ox. Um, most providers at Bugando have uh, one of these that they carry with them, um, and that's that's what they would use to to get your saturation at the bedside in the NICU. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a x-ray of a um, neonate with RDS. Um, this would be something that would be printed and laminated um, and be used alongside um, the other materials in, in the sim. And then, next slide, please. Looking at uh, the key takeaways from this sim, so, what we really wanted to emphasize is a just first recognition of an infant in respiratory distress. So um, I don't have the uh, exact details of the sim here in the PowerPoint, but in broad strokes, uh, basically there's a infant that presents uh, estimated gestational age of about 34 weeks um, and is breathing in the 70s with saturations in the 80s um, in room air. And we want a first our, our medical students and providers to recognize the signs of respiratory distress. So the tachypnea, the, grunt, the grunting, nasal flaring, um, retractions, and then also um, taking that next step since not every baby is put on monitors um, to make sure that they get that oxygen saturation using the pulse oximeter. Um, the next step being uh, before diagnostic workup stabilization. So um, either placing the baby on oxygen or our CPAP if they jump directly to that. And then moving towards that diagnostic workup and recognizing that respiratory distress is not solely due to um, sepsis um, in an infant and being able to kind of state that differential of um, well, prematurity, this could be related to RDS, and then other things that they could consider would be like um, MEC, which would be less likely in a premature infant, or uh, something like um, TTN, which would be less likely in a vaginal delivery premature infant. Um, then moving on to that next step of interpretation of the workup that we get. So we would kind of, we ideally want to guide them towards obtaining a chest x-ray, getting some basic lab work like a CBC. Um, looking at the chest x-ray, um, and if we could go back one slide. Looking at the chest x-ray and seeing um, kind of diffuse haziness of the lungs, um, air bronchograms, and recognizing that as consistent with, a, with an RDS type picture. Next slide, please. And then a CBC that uh, essentially the values would be low risk for infection, so a normal white count with a normal diff. Um, and then after Finally, after initial stabilization, um, there's a point in the sim where um, if they've placed the baby on CPAP on a low FiO2, somewhere like less than 30%, the baby starts to deteriorate and have increasing oxygen needs. And then at that point, recognizing that um, the treatment for respiratory distress syndrome, the ultimate treatment is gonna be administration of surfactant. Um, and that is something that as I said, can be done at, at Bugando. Um, they do have access to uh, in, in equipment for intubation and administration of surfactant. Um, but as part of the SIM, it, the SIM would really end at the point of deciding it's um, necessary to get surfactant and there wouldn't be necessarily a component where you had to physically intubate the mannequin. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And, to, and so that's kind of the, the sim in a nutshell. The, the next steps for this simulation, unfortunately, um, my time was cut short in uh, Tanzania, so didn't get a chance to implement this sim in person with the medical students and the uh, residents there to kind of elicit 
uh, feedback and further optimize the sim to tailor it best to Bugando. Um, and then ideally after, you know, after honing the sim to where it's going to be an effective learning tool, just implementing it and seeing uh, pre and post testing understanding of RDS. Um, and then uh, ideally big, biggest picture would be looking at outcomes of, of RDS and adherence to best practice guidelines um, within Bugando Medical Center. Um, next slide. And I, in summary, I'd like to thank uh, everybody that helped me out with this project. Uh, first and foremost, the Bugando Medical Center um, staff, um, and then Dr. Svant and Gruthaus for um, uh, significant input and uh, uh, encouragement along the way. Thanks, John. Um, unfortunately, we won't have uh, time for any uh, questions just because we're trying to keep a kind of tight timeline. Um, but if you have any questions for John, feel free to send them kind of privately through the chat to him during the presentation. Thanks. Thanks, John. We're going to be moving forward with Odera Eke. Hi, everyone. My name is Odera Eke. I'm a, for a one year MPH um, global health concentration program. Um, and so this is just like the initial slide. This is just the poster presentation right now for the first steps for the Northwestern University Medical Education Partnership Initiative. And this was a pediatric emergency simulation based um, education program at Masino University in Kisumu, Kenya. So a little bit about a background, um, pediatric emergency medicine is a medical specialty that does not exist in many parts of the world, um, specifically in low and middle income countries, um, such as Kenya, where this program will be implemented. Um, care for acutely ill children is usually provided by healthcare providers with limited emergency medicine or dedicated pediatric training. Um, and so stimulation based education is widely recognized tool to teach medically challenging and emergent scenarios. Um, and it, this is because it allows participants to gain experience and and preparation in a supervised environment without compromising patient safety. And so Northwestern is also um, known for its simulation based education programs. Next slide, please. Um, so the objective for this program was really to build an emergency medicine pediatric simulation training program. Um, and it was a collaboration between Northwestern University, Misano University, and the Jeremogi Oginga Odinga Teaching and Referral Hospital, otherwise known as JORTH, um, in Kenya as well. Next slide, please. Um, so we had, um, I think, sorry, Sarah, Sarah, if you click it, it's going to like, highlight, thank you. And then second one, I'll just have that done now too. Um, so for this program, we're really right now in the initial first two steps for um, like making this program and implementing it in Kenya. So we followed the current approach, which is a six step approach um, method to curriculum development or program development. Um, so the first step was really problem identification and general needs assessment, while the second step would be the targeted needs assessment. Um, so I'll just go forward with that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so for step one with the problem identification and general needs assessment, um, we were able to have stakeholder meetings um, with key informants at multiple institutional, um, sorry, institutional levels across both Messino and Jorth. And from that, we were able to um, identify that there was a need for further pediatric specialty training. So that, that would be both for the faculty and trainees, and it would involve both um, all clinical research and educational development. Um, and then for step two, for the targeted needs assessment, we were really able to identify that six year medical students would be the target learners for the first step of this program implementation. Um, they were also able to identify the specific case content topics for the simulation program and future directions for research and educational activities at both Misenu and Jorth. And then we were able to really identify the utilization of the simulation lab at Jorth and that evaluation could occur through um, covert clinical observation. So next slide, please. 
So um, overall, the next steps would be to translate these assessments into specific learning goals and objectives. That's just following through the CURF six step method um, and then determine educational strategies for this program. And also lastly, um, implement the simulation program, which most likely will be virtual at this point. Um, in this photo, this is Dr. Colleen Fant and Dr. Ashley Dubey Prasad on their trip to Kasimu, Kenya. And when they were engaging with the stakeholders to um, try and identify and do this assessment for the initial step. Um, so that's the end of this presentation. It was very quick. Um, and I would like to say special thanks to the Strom family for being able to provide the funding for this program, Misuno University and Jorth for their collaboration um, with this program. And also Dr. Colleen Fant and Dr. Ashley Dubey Prasad for allowing me to be part of this um, program. Awesome. Thanks, Odara. Um, so we've got some time for questions if anyone wants to type them in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, uh, I've got a question for you. So in terms of the development of um, the simulations that, or the kind of the needs assessment that you guys have done, what mm -hmm. type of simulations do you think will be helpful or what types are you guys anticipating working on? Um, I think they're looking at um, basic, like basic pediatric emergency um, case content. So for instance, like neonatal sepsis, neonatal jaundice, those are the specific content areas that they're trying to focus on, um, like the most presented in that context. Okay, cool. Um, and then it sounds, I, I know I've talked to Colleen a little bit about the infrastructure there, but can you talk a little bit about kind of the simulation infrastructure at the hospital? Yeah, so Jorth actually has a really great simulation lab right now. Um, so basically, they would be using that facility to implement the simulation program. Um, and so it would definitely have faculty and trainees from Misenu going to Jorth to use that simulation lab. And it is quite developed. And um, I don't know if you could go back in the presentation, but the pic photos that I had, Sarah, sorry, um, just to go like back a little bit, there are, I can show you those, that is a simulation lab in Jorth. Um, yeah, so this is Jorth right here. So that's actually theirs. And even um, I think two slides forward before this is also the simulation lab in Jorth. Oh yeah, right there. So um, it is quite, yeah, it's pretty nice. Yeah, that looks awesome. Cool, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we're going to be moving forward with our next presenter, which actually um, is Jeannie, Jeannie Frisbee, Zayden. Zayden? Hi, everyone. I'm Jeannie. Um, my project was on the, I'm a third year um, pediatrics resident, and my project was on the influences of an interdisciplinary global health program on cultural awareness um, as well as future global health involvement and my project was actually a pilot study conducted just within the pediatrics department next slide um, as far as background so we know that many medical students and residents um, have a growing interest in being involved in global health activities um, and from previous research there's known that residents identify lack of educational or field experience structure, lack of financial resources, and lack of time as barriers to their involvement in global health. Um, other studies have also shown that participation in college, um, medical school, or residency specialty specific global health programs make a physician more likely to be invo involved with global health work or work with immigrant or refugee populations in the future. Um, so I specifically looked at, next slide please, uh, the MAGAS Global Health Clinical Scholars Program, which I'm also participating in, um, to look at sort of its efficacy and its influence on involvement in global health work, as well as cultural awareness and self-awareness going forward. So the Clinical Scholars Program um, involves several things. Um, it involves medical and ethics simulations, lectures in medicine, law, economics, sociology, environmental health, and ethics. Um, it also includes performing a scholarly project and then at least one month of field experience. Um, specifically, pediatric residents can choose from Tanzania, Bolivia, or a refugee health uh, rotation, which are our established sites, um, or if they have a known alternative well-established site um, that they've traveled to before. And then there's a formal debriefing 
um, after that. I will emphasize that this, um, this program involves, involves residents from many different specialties throughout McGaw. So there's an exchange of ideas, not just within the pediatrics program. Next slide, please. So our hypothesis is that um, this multidisciplinary approach to global health education within residency uh, would improve overall self-reported cultural awareness as well as um, to be a predictor of global health involvement and future career choices. So the uh, next slide, please. The way we conducted our study, we surveyed um, previous residents from the Lurie Pediatrics Program from 2013, who graduated between 2013 and 2019. Uh, these dates were specifically chosen because that's the duration that the Global Health Clinical Scholars Program has been um, in, implemented. Um, we collected baseline characteristics, Likert scales of agreement um, regarding both self-awareness and cultural awareness within the global health sphere. Um, also collect, uh, collected ideas about cur current involvement in global health work or work with immigrant and refugee populations. And then also um, finally looked at the Global Health Certificate um, Program scholars and to look at their satisfaction with the program and any lessons that they learned through the program. Um, we, we compared um, those who participated in the program with those who did not participate um, and used t-tests and chi-square analysis where appropriate. Next slide, please. Um, so we overhauled, we overall had 64 participants in the survey, um, eight who had previously participated in the Global Health Clinical Scholars Program and 56 who did not. There was no significant difference between their baseline characteristics. Next slide, please. Um, we found that um, the Global Health Clinical Scholars uh, graduates were more likely to have an understanding of the, their impact being um, a physician in another country would have on locals, as well as the impact that being a physician on another, in another country would have on them. Um, and those were both statistically significant. And then they had a slightly higher preparedness for obstacles encountered in a foreign culture, although this was not statistically significant. Next slide, please. Um, we also found that they were more likely to have previous global health exper experience to um, be um, to have global health experience in residency, and that's in part because it is a requirement of the program, and also to um, be to um, sorry to be currently involved in global health activities, although um, this was not statistically significant between the global health certificate participants and the non-participants. Um, we also did find that both participants and non-participants found that their percentage of current involvement in global health work and their ideal involvement um, was different. And so um, showing that most people would ideally be more involved with global health if possible. Although the differences between the global health uh, scholars and non-participants was not significant. Some of the barriers that, that both the participants and non-participants identified um, to being involved with global health work as attendings um, or being involved with refugee or immigrant populations was time, salary support, um, family concerns, concerns about safety, and other, other barriers that included re loan repayment contracts, being early in their career, um, or having clinics that were specifically identified to be refugee or immigrant um, clinics, as well as um, poor funding for pro bono work in the re refugee and immigrant populations. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Next slide. Um, and although I can't focus on this, it is on my poster, but um, some of the things that the Global Health Scholars did find is that they were um, they gave a very overwhelming agreement that they would recommend the Global Health Clinical Scholars Program to future residents as a stepping stone to a global health career. Um, some of their testimony, um, they stated that it made me more understanding of various approaches to medicine and more appreciative of the surplus we have in the US. And it also factored significantly into my research and career plans for medical education. 
In addition, um, another participant noticed that the experience was filled with countless moments and lessons that impacted me and shaped the way I practice medicine today, mostly improving my competence to accept cultural differences, practices, and worldviews. Next slide, please. And um, in conclusion, our study did show that um, an interdisciplinary global health program does have an influence on both cultural and self-awareness within the global health sphere. Um, it shows that across the board, there's a need for further institutional structure, support and funding for global health activities for um, both residents, but especially for attending physicians and better support for um, physicians to be involved with refugee and immigrant populations. And future studies will expand to include other graduates um, from the different specialties at McGaugh. Next slide, please. And I just want to thank Liz um, and Ashti for their help in creating and implementing this study, as well as um, my program director um, and Brad Link for helping connect me with um, all of the uh, Lurie alumni. Next slide. And these are just some of the references of previous studies. Any questions? Awesome. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, if you have any questions for Jeannie, um, you can go ahead and put them in the chat box. We've got about 30 seconds for questions. Um, and while we're waiting for to see if anyone has any other questions, um, do you think you would find similar results if you looked at other specialties? Um, well, I also see that Sharon has a quick question. <laughs> um, I, I think it's hard to tell um, looking at other specialties. We did have a pretty large um, sample size, so I would hope that this would be generalizable, but that's what our next steps would be. Um, I think that um, more of the primary care specialties would um, be more likely to correspond with the results that we found and pot potentially find different results with some of the surgical or less primary care specialties. Um, Sarah, are you able to unmute Sharon real quick so she can ask a quick question? Sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Jeannie, thank you so much. I was really excited to see the results of your study. Um, I saw with enthusiasm the suggestion that you had for, and know that we're starting to do it, um, sp spreading resident education into more of an immigrant slash refugee population also. Um, and this question doesn't have to be answered by you, maybe Liz, and if no one can answer it, that's fine. Um, do you think there's a way we can, selfishly, I would love to have all residents have this education and opportunity to participate. And so selfishly, I'm sitting here thinking, how can we implement or institute or work in the education with immigrant and refugee populations, even if residents are not participating in the Global Health Certificate Program? Um, I, I guess I would put a plug for Angela's presentation. You might have missed it at the very beginning because we started early, but um, her and Kristen and a group of other people are working on um, a pilot program to be able to, to um, educate residents on immigrant and refugee health. And I think that would be a great way um, it seems like it's a module or sim where you would be able to um, implement that for a larger population that isn't included in the global health uh, certificate program. Yeah, and sadly, I did miss, I saw John's, John, yours was excellent also. I did miss Angela's because I was a little bit late, but you're right, I will uh, love to hear more about that. And it's Ashti here. Um, Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Jeannie, and, and Angela and John for everything, um, talking about all the sim and pediatrics. I did want to say that we talk a lot about and dream a lot about, and it's kind of the time is ripe about, you know, health equity scholars and that there is a global health concentration and a community health concentration, maybe an advocacy concentration. Like there should just be a big umbrella. It won't, you know, not to change a lot of the content and competencies that exist, but to have everything. And so that's actually like, converse, you know, kind of happening organically. You know, some of the shift with travel has made that happen. So I won't go on too much, but yes, also my dreams. So more to come. Great, okay. So uh, with that, I did wanna introduce our next speaker. Uh, they actually were not able to join us live today. 
um, but they did record a presentation that they would like us to hear. For the sake of time, we also did edit this pre presentation a little bit. So um, we're gonna start it. And um, I will be discussing my research and um, First of all, I want to thank the Institute of Global Health for allowing me to present my research remotely. Um, I do apologize, I'm not able to be present uh, for a Zoom conference call. So again, our goal was to establish the prevalence of prostate cancer at autopsy majoring males. And we did this by establishing a network between four different sites uh, in Nigeria. Um, so the sites went from University of Joss um, up in the north to University of Joss in the southeast. Um, and then finally, University of Badong as well as Lagos State University in the southwest. And these sites were chosen primarily because they had established departments of urology and pathology. And secondly, because they were pretty um, representative in terms of capturing some of the diversity and ethnicities in Nigeria. Uh, in terms of our methods, uh, we looked at men who were over the age of 40, who were postborn for less than three days and were undergoing forensic autopsy for any cause and basically excluded men who had known prostate cancer diagnoses or any kind of urologic malignancies. Um, our outcomes were primarily related to gleason grade, which is a way of capturing the aggressiveness of prostate cancer, as well as tumor stage, and then looking at the dynamics in terms of centralized review amongst Nigerian pathologists and comparing them to American pathologists. Um, this schematic uh, basically tries to capture what we did with the prostates once they left the body. Uh, so basically what we did was amputate uh, the seminal vesicles, which are those curly structures on the top left um, <clears throat> corner, which abut the prostate. And next we fix the prostate in formalin, then we section them into four millimeter cuts, um, stain them with inorthistochemical agents, and then finally examine them under the microscope. We also collected some other data points, uh, which included things like the patient's age, um, their family and medical history, and then various variables uh, basically that would help us establish prostate cancer diagnoses. Uh, in terms of our progress, um, so we traveled to Nigeria back in August 2017. And the goal of that trip was one, uh, to finalize and to standardize a research protocol across the four various sites and establish agreements between all the pathologists as well as the referring um, physicians. Uh, we also conducted an in-service uh, instruction for all the pathologists, uh, simply because we realized that there was, heterogene there was heterogeneity in terms of how they were bringing prostate tumors uh, to begin with. So um, globally, um, the criteria for how to grade prostates has changed between 2005, which was the last um, guideline update, um, to 2014. And we found that several of the pathologists were using 2005 criteria. Um, so it was a good opportunity just to get everyone on the same page to establish consensus for review. Uh, the trip was also targeted at um, making provisions for how to share data, um, how to collect data, um, as well as to obtain ethical approval at each of the sites. Um, more than just kind of establishing this um, research uh, network for gathering autopsy data, uh, we also met and included urologists um, who are at each of those partner institutions uh, so that we could start to collect uh, tumors from patients who are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer and alive uh, to better understand genetic differences um, in how prostate cancer aggressiveness was expressed and uh, to establish that data point uh, for Nigerian men and compare them to existing data sets in African American and white men in the U.S. 
Um, so on this slide, uh, on the right hand side, you have a picture of a freshly preserved prostate which has been sectioned with various levels and is about to undergo staining as well as histologic review. Um, and this is just kind of give you accomplished um, in the time that has since passed. Now with any kind of global health project there are several constraints that can be frustrating and also even um, quite debilitating. <laughs> Um, so shortly after we left Nigeria, for several months, the Lakers site was unable to crew patients uh, because of a loss of fever outbreak. So several of the hospital labs and the morgue were shut down. And Lagos, of course, is our primary recruitment site. Um, in Calabar, uh, the, the university underwent an administrative strike that lasted well over a year. Um, so we weren't able to really make much progress from that site as well. And then in Ibadan, we had difficulty onboarding the site due to bureaucratic issues um, with that department. Um, finally, in Jos, um, we were really hampered in terms of recruitment efforts uh, simply because our population was heavily Muslim, and uh, due to that belief system, typically um, relatives do have to bury the dead uh, within a short time course from when uh, death occurs. Um, so it was hard to get um, family members to consent to autopsy. That being said, we were able to achieve some pilot data, um, and we do have several other subjects that are weighing analysis in the pipeline. Uh, but what we've found to date uh, from our 39 samples, um, 30 of which were from Lagos, and other ones as listed, uh, we found that the mean age of our autopsy was 55 years, approximately, which of course is younger than what um, the average life expectancy is here in the US. Uh, we found that similarly, uh, prosthetic weights were smaller, probably due to the younger age of the men in autopsy at 25.8 grams. And we were actually quite shocked by this statistic, but we found that the overall prostate cancer prevalence is about 10.3%. Um, and it rose to about 18% for men who are over 60. Now, part of that is probably because we have an incomplete story in terms of our data accrual, um, but this estimate is actually much lower than previously established prevalence estimates from other biopsy, sorry, other aut autopsy studies. Um, in terms of the one that I showed you earlier in this slide, earlier in this talk, um, that prevalence was about 49%. Now, what is the impact of this study? Uh, basically, in a country like Nigeria, which has limited diagnostic biopsy capabilities and basically no access to widespread screening, um, prostate cancer treatment, um, as well as awareness efforts are significantly hampered. And our goal is that by identifying increased prevalence of prostate cancer in this population, we can help to shape efforts at prostate cancer screening and also bring awareness about treating prostate cancer so that it's a less fatal cause of death for men in Nigeria. Uh, secondly, with this data, we can also better understand if there are shared genetic um, factors that might also cause, that might also um, explain some of the disproportionate prostate cancer outcomes we see in this population, as well as African Americans in the US. Uh, so this is an ongoing study, um, and hopefully more data will be forthcoming in the near future. Um, finally, I would like to thank the Center for Global Health uh, for the opportunity to travel to Nigeria and embark on this project. It was funded by the Catalina Grant, as well as the Northwestern University Department of Urology. Uh, many thanks to Adam Murphy, uh, who is my research mentor here at Northwestern, as well as Martin Blasland, one um, of the collaborators at UIC. And of course, uh, this project will not be possible without our collaborators at each of the institutions in Nigeria. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, so again, uh, Roti Minetti was not able to join us live. Um, so we're just going to continue on with our next presenter. Alexandra. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Alex Tarzakan. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Alex Alexandra Tarzikan, and I'm a Shruti Clinical Fellow in Health and Human Rights, working at the Center for International Human Rights at the Law School. And today I'll be presenting on one of our Access to Health projects, which is aimed at enhancing community health education through technology in Lagos, Nigeria. Next slide. For those who aren't familiar with Access to Health, um, next slide, please. Yeah. It was founded by uh, Professor Juliet Sorensen and Dr. Shannon Galvin in 2011, and its aim is to uh, work across disciplines to create targeted, sustainable projects to address health-related issues um, of partner communities around the world. So for our Access to Health project in Nigeria, we're working with um, the Justice Empowerment Initiative, the JEI, which is a civil society organization working in Nigerian urban informal settlements and the Nigerian Slum and Informal Settlement Federation. Next slide, please. The Access to Health partnership with JEI um, has centered on community health education. And our objective was to develop a curriculum that was responsive to the needs of um, of the inform uh, informal urban communities. We train community health educators on um, different topics, including common diseases, sexual education, and basic hygiene. And community health educators are lay community members um, who are trained in providing peer-led health information discussions and can serve as health advocates for the community. Next slide. Um, in March 2016, that's when our, the project started, a uh, needs assessment was conducted uh, using uh, different focus groups, uh, community discussions, and meetings with key stakeholders within uh, JAI and the Federation and other partners from the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, the Ministry of Health, and other local organizations. And based on the needs assessment, a community health education curriculum was developed. Um, access to health traveled to Lagos and CHEs were trained and the curriculum was evaluated and revised based on knowledge-based pre and post um, tests. And to date, the CHE program has impacted 112 communities, each made up of about 1,000 to 30,000 individuals. Next slide, please. The needs assessment revealed um, that uh, in addition to infrastructure barriers of poverty, physical access, and absent sanitation, additional health constraints um, included low rates of health literacy, a lack of uh, health information, and communities also expressed that um, they were unsure of where and how to access health resources. And the curriculum included modules on adult learning and um, teaching techniques and was adapted from existing validated curricula from USAID and others and also integrated Nigerian uh, guidelines. Uh, next slide. To, to test the effectiveness of the first iteration of the curriculum, 23 question survey was designed uh, using multiple choice and open-ended question format. And it was drawn to directly assess the information contained in the curriculum. There were 30, uh, uh, there was a total of 30 participants in the study and knowledge-based pre and post tests were developed to assess the baseline knowledge and understanding of the material that was presented. Descript descriptive statistics were used to, develop, to describe the response rate and a t-test was used to compare response rates between uh, pre and post testing results. Next slide, please. Um, we found a moderate but statistically significant increase in percentage of questions correct from the pre and post tests, indicating that the curriculum was effective. And the survey provided a nuanced analysis um, that allowed our team to revise the curriculum and um, emphasize the areas with low baseline knowledge and minimal improvement and de-emphasize areas with high baseline knowledge. And next slide, please. Um, throughout our projects, access to throughout our project, access to basic health knowledge uh, remains elusive to many communities, and so we wanted to try and um, enhance our curriculum. And um, by providing the CHEs with updated uh, materials and other health health information, has proven to be difficult. Uh, because they often are faced with inconsistent internet access and at times uh, no access to power and so they have to rely on their memory to deliver these trainings um, and also to be able to answer questions from the community. Next slide please. 
Um, and so in order to solve some of these problems, we partnered uh, with Slalom in, two, in 2018, which is a consulting firm with expertise in informatics and business processes to design a website and mobile application solution to increase access to health information and transparency to services. And so that the CHUs could use these, um, these uh, tools uh, while conducting the educational sessions in the field. And in 2019, the slalom team traveled to Lagos to train a new cohort of the CHEs and field test the mobile application and pilot the website. The functionality of these two solutions were tested in the field and um, communication vehicles were assessed to foster collaboration across the CHEs and their communities. The community members, um, based on the feedback that we received, requested uh, SMS recaps of the information that was provided after education after the educational sessions, and um, they also informed us that the visual information that was provided on the mobile application and the website, um, at, at, along with the diagrams and the videos, helped uh, provide deeper understanding of, of uh, the information that was presented. And so moving forward, ATH will uh, um, update the solutions based on the user feedback that we received and create more content for low literacy populations. Um, a data collection and strategy and analysis strategy um, will be developed to collect uh, health information and health data, map health facility information and continuously assess um, the healthcare landscape in Nigeria. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. That was really cool. Um, I know nothing about uh, app development or anything like that. Are you, for your next steps of rolling it out, are you planning to roll it out within Nigeria or within uh, kind of other countries? So we're specifically going to pilot this in Lagos first and then um, hopefully expand to Port Harcourt because JI also has a presence there. And then um, we hope to be able to later expand it to other similar um, countries with similar context. Nice. Have you gotten any feet? It sounds like you haven't yet rolled out the app yet. So we have, we did um, a small pilot when we went to Lagos um, in September of last year. And um, they, they provided us the feedback that I mentioned um, after we tested the functionality and um, they told us that these visuals that we provided uh, were really helpful. And also just to note that um, the content that's on the mobile application and um, the website are both in English and Yoruba and will be translated to other uh, local languages as well. Nice. We've got two questions. Um, we've got about a minute for questions, but two questions from the chat box. Um, one of them is asking how much time lapsed between the pre and post tests, like how much time there was between the two. And then if the pre and post tests were assessing the knowledge of the community health educators or the community members themselves. So uh, the pre and post tests, um, I believe there was three months, um, three months in between. Um, and then the, um, the baseline knowledge was being assessed of the so we trained a cohort of community health educators and then the pre and post test was administered to the um, communities that they had that the CHEs had, had um, trained. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we're going to move on with Jennifer. Hi, everyone. All right. So I'm Jennifer Adrissi. I'm a PGY4 neurology resident at Northwestern. Um, I'll be starting my movement disorders fellowships in July. Um, so what I'm presenting is actually a case report um, from when I was back in Lusaka, Zambia at the University Teaching Hospital this past fall. So I'll be presenting a case of JC virus granule cell neuronopathy in an HIV positive patient pre presenting with severe ataxia. Um, and shout out to the um, UTH residents, um, Mashima, Dr. Mashina, uh, Mashina Chomba, um, Lorraine Chishimba, Stanley Zimba, and then my two um, mentors here at Northwestern, Dr. Tarian and Dr. Kralnik, um, and then Dr. Saylor um, from Hopkins, who is full-time at UTH. Next slide, please. All right, so a little bit of background before we start. So JC virus granule cell neuronopathy is a lytic infection of granule cells in the cerebellum, uh, which is caused by reactivation of JC virus um, in, in, in immunocompromised hosts. Um, so JC virus 
actually if you check the general population, about 50 to 90% of people have been exposed and actually have antibodies to JC virus and about one third of the general population actually has a persistent asymptomatic infection. So it really doesn't cause any issues and doesn't cause disease unless the immune system is significantly compromised. So JC virus is a polyoma virus um, that is the causative agent for progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy or PML, uh, which is a demyelinating disorder also on the differential for abnormal brain lesions and immunocompromised. But unlike JC, um, but unlike PML, excuse me, JC virus granule cell neuronopathy is actually contained to the cerebellum. Um, it involves the gray matter as opposed to the white matter and sort of um, thinking back to our, our neuroanatomy um, and pathology. So the gray matter really includes the cell bodies of the neurons while the white matter is mostly those myelinated axons which gives it that white color. Um, next slide please. All right, so getting to our case. So um, like I said, this was back this past fall. So this is an inpatient, a 42 year old male with a past medical history significant for HIV on heart therapy. He presented with one year of progressive neurologic decline. Specifically, his symptoms were progressive gait instability, um, incoordination, slurred speech, and difficulty swallowing. So by the time we actually saw him, he was unable to walk. Um, he, you couldn't even understand his speech for the most part because of the um, significant slurring. And then on exam, he has severe ocular and appendicular dysmetria, also really significant truncal ataxia. He was actually unable to even sit up on his own um, and severe uh, dysarthria or slurred speech. His laboratory analysis was most significant for a CD4 count of 218, so low. Uh, we did do basic CSF analysis, um, so cell count, glucose, protein, gram stain um, were all available um, and unremarkable. However, the JC virus testing was not available. You can go to the next slide, please. All right, so he was actually admitted for, I wanna say about a week before we were actually able to get imaging. Um, so just a little bit of background about UTH. So UTH is a, our university teaching hospital, it's a safety net hospital. Um, so most of the people there um, are very low income. Um, they actually have a cost sharing type of model. So for all of the tests, most of the labs and the imaging, the patients or their families have to pay out of pocket. However, if they're unable to do so, they have a, um, a cost sharing with the government. And so we were eventually able to advocate for this patient to get a CT brain um, at our hospital. So looking at the images here, you can see that the cerebral hemispheres kind of further up there, they actually look okay, um, pretty preserved. But then when you're looking further down um, at the cerebellum, there's significant bilateral atrophy there uh, with preservation of the white matter. You can go to the next screen. All right. So while unable to obtain JC virus PCR, we were able to make the clinical diagnosis of possible JC virus granule cell neuronopathy based on clinical presentation and imaging. Um, and this diagnostic criteria is kind of extrapolated from our PML um, criteria um, that has been agreed upon by the AAN um, neuroinfectious disease section. Um, basically, since we don't have the JC virus um, PCR, but we do have um, the significant clinical and imaging findings, we're able to make that possible diagnosis. Um, if we did have the PCR, um, but maybe either not the clinical or not the imaging um, findings, then you say probable, and then for definite, you have to have all three. So um, of note, this patient was actually diagnosed with virologic failure earlier that year um, of his heart therapy. So his CD4 count was 35, seven months prior to admission. And he had to actually be transferred um, or transitioned to a second line heart therapy. So while it's unclear, and a lot of this is, you know, kind of thinking backwards, we thought possibly um, he may have had increased susceptibility to JC virus reactivation and JC virus granule cell neuronopathy due to this unknown duration of inadequate viral suppression. So we don't actually know Know how long his CD4 count was low um, before we were able to before they were able to figure that out and switch his therapy. So that may have made him more susceptible at that time. You can go to the next slide. 
Um, and so just kind of to wrap up our patient, he, you know, while we weren't able to follow up with him, he follows up in the neuroinfectious disease clinic for HIV um, management. Um, he got p physical therapy while he was on an inpatient and then was actually discharged. Um, but sort of the, the big takeaways from this is in an immunocompromised patient presenting with clinical and radiologic signs of cerebellar degeneration, you should have a pretty low threshold to consider JC virus granule cell neuronopathy. And there's been about four to five case reports um, of this disease so far. And so it's been reported in multiple immunosuppressed populations, um, including patients with HIV, MS, and lymphoma, all of which have been on some type of um, immunosuppression or immunotherapy. Go to the next slide. All right, and this is our last slide. And so in HIV populations, adequate viral suppression and heart adherence is important in helping to prevent worsening of uh, the neurologic symptoms in this condition. So there's no clear treatment. Um, while there have been different kind of case reports of trying different um, immunomodulatory agents in it, there's no approved um, treatment for this. The main thing is to try to um, basically improve the immune system and in our HIV patients is making sure they're on heart therapy. So there are 1.2 million people living with HIV in Zambia, including 16% of adults age 15 to through 59 in the capital of Lusaka, where UTH is. And so JC virus granule cell neuronopathy can actually be the first manifestation of AIDS in this population. Um, and it's, pro it's likely underdiagnosed just because, like I said, there's a lot of um, obstacles to to getting labs, to getting um, lumbar punctures, as well, as well as imaging. And so there's probably more of this there um, than we actually know, but this um, is actually the first case report out of Sub-Saharan Africa that, that shows JC virus granule cell neuronopathy. Um, and increasing HIV screening and faster implementation of heart therapy may be helpful in preventing this condition in this population. Next slide. And these are just my references. Again, I want to thank all of the um, neurology residents at UTH um, who were just so welcoming when I was there. Um, Dr. Saylor, who was my, um, my site mentor there, as well as Dr. Zatarian and Karalnik here, who have been great, um, great mentors as well. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. That was great. Um, is the main difference kind of here, I guess, I don't know, I haven't, it's been a long time since I thought about JC virus. Do you typically diagnose it with the P, like a CSF PCR or how do you diagnose it here? Yeah, so you can have the serum PCR, so it's actually a titer, or you can um, get the CSF. So when you're looking for a neurologic involvement, um, you would use the C C CSF PCR and you can look at the titer there. Um, and then the reactivation of JC virus should actually have a high titer. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. We're going to move on uh, with Charlotte. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Hi. Um, I'm going to be talking about asylum clinics today. We can go to the next slide. Um, my initial global experience uh, got canceled long before COVID, so I started looking for more local and regional um, aspects of clinical care that were in need of kind of global health support. Um, and Dr. Dubé was actually very helpful and introduced me to the concept of asylum clinics. And it's um, evolving primarily, especially on the Eastern Coast, they're starting to get a lot more clinics up and running. Um, but it is this idea that medical students can be involved in assisting refugees with their process of asylum seeking by providing medical affidavits in that process. And um, while these are gaining more ground and footing, I also wanted to parse out some of the legal and ethical issues that are um, a little more convoluted and kind of prevent them from um, progressing. And so um, going to the next slide and um, the next slide after that, um, kind of talking more about what the legal aspects of asylum are. I think um, my knowledge initially was very limited and it is a um, kind of big process. And that's why I liked this photo is that it breaks it down into kind of the four main ways that we think about refugees even arriving to the US. Um, Recently, with a lot of the humanitarian crises revolving around border patrol and um, detention centers for refugees, we've kind of 
shifted our thoughts to the the D aspect, the defensive asylum process, which is a process of um, sending refugees back to their country who have not claimed asylum. But um, I want to shift more to the B affirmative asylum process, which is when um, refugees enter the country and are trying to go through the step-by-step -step process of claiming asylum. Um, there are a lot of legal aspects to it in a legal affidavit. You have to have a reasonable fear of past persecution um, on the basis of race, religion, ethnicity. Um, and the problem is that the burden does rest with the asylee in um, proving that they meet the criteria not only of a refugee, but of someone who um, merits asylum. Um, and so next slide. Oh, next slide, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, one before that. Um, so Physicians for Human Rights is a group um, that really focuses on advocacy in any global health sphere. Um, but medical students have started to form their own Physicians for Human Rights organizations um, with the intention of completing me medical affidavits, which um, in a medical sense are very simple. They are forensic evaluations. They um, involve a brief medical exam and a mental health evaluation. They are not medical care. And so that's why um, PHR has really focused on eliciting eliciting medical students to um, spearhead this because um, they can be heavily involved with scheduling, with, um, with coordinating clinic movement, and with um, actually drafting an affidavit. Um, and next slide. It does require um, a licensed clinician, though, who has been trained in these forensic evaluations. And so um, regardless of what the medical students are doing, the whole evaluation does take place with a licensed clinician. And um, overall, it's really a history taking the background of the asylum seeker, um, the conditions in their home country and their home culture that may have predisposed them to needing asylum, and then doing a detailed skin examination that might correlate with any findings of um, trauma and or mental health trauma. So um, taking note of what depressive symptoms, any PTSD symptoms that they might be manifesting. And then with that comes the physician recommendation um, based on their evaluation. Um, do the findings correlate with the story of, of, of prior trauma and of needing a refugee status? And they can make recommendations for future medical care. But um, that's kind of where the big line comes into play. It's not a medical assessment. There's no patient provider relationship. It's really a client of an asylee and then the um, physician as the evaluator, but not as a doctor. And so next slide. Um, and so that has kind of been the struggle and, and the difference in building this clinic and, and gaining support for a clinic is you're kind of taking a business model of having core values and trying to create a clinic model that does not involve any business. And so next slide, um, thinking about global health clinics in a local sphere as what, um, what values are you trying to uphold and then who are really the stakeholders in it? Who are we benefiting? Are we benefiting medical students who are gaining great global training and who are going to be the next global providers? Um, and how are we affecting future asylum seekers? How are we affecting our judicial process um, in terms of kind of aiding this backlog of uh, asylum applications? Next slide. And so I also wanted to briefly touch on kind of the ethical frameworks that we're looking at when, when considering these clinics. Obviously, um, Global Health is very familiar with the idea of beneficence justice, as is healthcare. Um, but egalitarianism is kind of the, the big theme of these clinics as well, the fact that there needs to be equality in treatment of our um, refugees. And, and without that, we are not um, we are not providing them just care. And so I think that is where um, Global Global health providers need to really be the, the new force because egalitarianism is not one of our main pillars of healthcare necessarily, but it is of global health. Um, and so next slide. I just want to say thank you for, to Dr. Dubé um, for introducing me to all of this and for helping me through the advising. Sara, of course. Uh, Lita Zane is one of the um, global health participants who is um, going to be a trained provider should we ever get the clinic up and running and then to the medical students and our undergraduate collaborators as well who are working on this clinic awesome thanks charlotte 
Um, I know one of the things that we've struggled with from a PEDS standpoint is trying to make a business case for a clinic for people who can't pay you. Um, I was wondering if, how, if there is currently a clinic, it sounds like you're trying to get a clinic like this up and running at Northwestern or kind of how you've worked um, with the university or with the hospital for that. Right. And so that's the goal also behind medical students spearheading it is they they essentially are allowed to have a volunteer organization that kind of piggybacks off of the resources that we may have in a medical school or in a hospital setting. So a lot of these evaluations take place, for example, in SIM centers that have a clinic um, space set up, but it's not used primarily for clinical purposes, but you really just need a clinical exam room. So you need to have the patient exam table and all of the same um, tools that you would have in any clinic resource center. But um, apart from that, it's a really low cost um, model where really the tr cost is in training the clinician providers. And so um, I think that is also why PHR so emphasizes the medical student aspect is not only are you training the future leaders, but they are the ones that essentially can produce this volunteer model that um, also is aiding people without so much of the business convoluting it. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. <laughs> well, thank you. So we're going to continue with Ariana. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Ariana. I'm a PGY4 anesthesia resident. Sorry in advance if it gets loud or something. I'm just in the hallway here. <laughs> um, but so I'm going to be presenting a case report it's entitled The Role of Point of Care Ultrasound in Pulmonary Hypertension. So luckily in February of this year, I was able to go to Ghana, Kumasi, Ghana, right before all the COVID stuff happened. I went with Dr. Sarah Clark and Dr. Kim Nguyen, Northwestern Anesthesia Attending and Fellow. And uh, we can go to the next slide, please. We went to the Kumfo Anokie Teaching Hospital in Kumasi, Ghana. So it's the second largest city in Ghana, about 3 million people, like urban, urban setting, large hospital. Um, and we were able to work with um, the anesthesia department over there. And one of the anesthesia and ICU attendings uh, we worked with, he was a really good teacher and very skilled at ultrasound and point of care ultrasound. So I'll be discussing one of the patients that we encountered with him. Um, so just, uh, just previous slide real quick. Just background on pulmonary hypertension. It's a debilitating progressive disease characterized by remodeling the pulmonary vasculature, which can lead to right heart failure and eventual death. The incidence of pulmonary hypertension in Africa is reported to be higher than other areas of uh, Europe or U United States. And the thought is that it's due to a higher burden of endemic risk factors, such as rheumatic heart disease, schistosomiasis, TB, sickle cell, and HIV. And patients with pulmonary hypertension in Africa also have worse outcomes, higher mortality rate, and um, thought is that they present to healthcare late and have a delayed diagnosis and treatment. And the gold standard for diagnosis is right heart catheterization, but this is rarely available in Africa. Next slide, please. So our patient was a 56-year-old female with uh, basically misdiagnosis of asthma for several years. She was in and out of the hospital with multiple exacerbations, um, treated with bronchodilators and oxygen, but kept returning to the hospital. And she was admitted to cath two years prior with hypoxic arrest found to have a pulmonary embolism. And despite treatment, she was um, still not doing well. So later that admission, um, actually the attending that worked with Dr. Moses, he diagnosed her with uh, pulmonary hypertension after seeing RV systolic pressures over 80. And basically if severe pulmonary hypertension is over 60. So she was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension at that time and then um, started on therapy by cardiology. And she was doing pretty well for over a year. And then um, this current admission in February she was uh, presented to the outside hospital with uh, pneumonia. And then she had a sudden, again, hypoxic arrest, um, likely secondary to PE again, since she had a DVT. 
Um, she was started on anticoagulation, Lasix, and sildenafil. And uh, bedside ultrasound showed, again, signs of RV failure with RV cell pressure of 68, uh, moderate tricuspid regurg, and dilation of her art, right atrium and right ventricle. She was started on uh, levofed and milrinone infusions and uh, required a long ICU stay to wean off of inotropes. Uh, next slide, please. So this just kind of bring, brings up the discussion of uh, differences of pulmonary hypertension in Africa versus developed countries. Um, surprisingly, actually, the majority of pulmonary hypertension is caused by left heart disease in Africa, which is similar to that of developed countries. And this was found from a, a recent cohort registry in Africa, like 2014. There was, they studied um, over 200 patients in Africa and found similar results actually for the most common cause. And diagnosis wise, like I mentioned, right heart cath is the gold standard for diagnosis, but this is rarely available in Africa due to limited resources and expense. So echo is the most commonly used diagnostic method. Um, prognosis wise, um, pulmonary hypertension has a higher six month mortality rate up to 28%. And compared with that in Canada, it was only 14.5% at, at one year. And this is probably due to the late presentation, um, advanced heart failure state that they presented and poor functional status. Next slide, please. Um, and then just comparing right heart cath and TTE for diagnosis. Right heart cath is the gold standard since it measures the pulmonary artery pressures directly, but it's uh, an invasive procedure with the inherent risks such as uh, pulmonary hemorrhage and arrhythmias. And again, it's very rare to have these uh, resources in Africa. Um, TTE is cheaper, non-invasive, more commonly available. And, um, but the cons is that only moderately specific, about 72%, and only estimates the PA systolic pressures. Um, requires a tricuspid regurgitation jet and um, it's less accurate in patients with lung diseases. Next slide, please. So just in conclusion, pulmonary hypertension has a worse prognosis in Africa, possibly due to late presentation and misdiagnosis. The right heart cath um, gold standard is not available at most centers. So TTE is the most common way that this is diagnosed in Africa. Um, this is being more, uh, more and more available, especially in acute care settings. And this can decrease the time to diagnosis and improve outcomes. Um, challenges include the cost and availability of ultrasound machines, although they are getting much cheaper, such as this uh, $2,000 butterfly iPhone device, um, and the need for specialized training. And there are, there's a need for more high quality studies to determine the efficacy of point of care ultrasound and screening for pulmonary hypertension. And that's it. Next slide. Um, some more pictures. I just want to thank all the attendings, uh, residents, and staff at CATH for their um, for welcoming us and supporting our trip, and also Dr. Sarah Clark for uh, being the global health mentor for me. Awesome. Thanks, Ariana. That was really interesting. Um, when you were talking with Dr. Moses, did he identify anything that would be helpful for them kind of at that hospital in terms of additional training or resources? Or um, was it more like a general sense that you got? Yeah, so he actually has been kind of spearheading that, like teaching the residents. And he, he holds like um, kind of like a conference kind of session where they'll do like hands-on training. Um, and they, like in terms of the supply, they, they only have two ultrasound devices there for the anesthesia department. Um, so they could use more ultrasound machines. And I think he, he has some kind of uh, structured training, but just like more, probably um, more of an organized uh, implementation of that would be good. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Ariana. All right, so our last presentation is going to be by John. John Weber. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So the title of my presentation is called um, Improving Access to Pediatric Ultrasound in Malawi. Um, and one point that I hope to impart on all the listeners is um, that just by saying access, there's a lot more that kind of goes behind the scenes um, than just you know, essentially kind of having the equipment available to examine patients. Um, and I hope to demonstrate what um, actually access to um, a radiology service means um, throughout the course of this presentation. So um, I traveled to Malawi in November and December of 2019. Um, so here's my poster. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So a very brief in introduction to Malawi. And um, I think this is important to um, kind of have an understanding of the context in which um, we were in Malawi um, and kind of get a, a sense of the healthcare needs of that specific community. So just in brief, Malawi is a landlocked country in Southeast Africa um, and has one of the lowest GDP um, per capita rates in the world. It also has one of the highest rates of HIV AIDS in the world. Um, in addition to HIV AIDS, it's also endemic for numerous other infectious diseases um, such as malaria, TB, schizosomiasis, yellow fever, typhoid, hepatitis, and rabies. Um, and during my time there, I saw evidence of that um, while I was working in the hospital. Um, Malawi itself as a country ranks 185 out of 190 um, in the WHO report of health um, systems development. Uh, in Malawi, there is a mix of private and public hospitals. Um, the public hospitals are divided into three tiers of care, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Tertiary being um, the most advanced in the country. So you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I worked at a tertiary public hospital in the country's largest city and capital called the Long Way. The hospital is called Kamuzu Central Hospital, and this is a view of the hospital as you're um, kind of walking through the front entrance. It has approximately 600 to 1,000 beds, although the hospital is almost always above capacity. Um, even though it officially says it's 600 to 1,000 beds, that typically means about two to three pediatric patients per quote unquote bed. Um, and it it's, uh, can be more, you know, seeing patients in the hallway, um, things like that. It's an estimated that 70% of admissions to Kamuzu are related to infectious disease or HIV. Um, a little bit about the radiology department. The equipment currently includes one stationary ultrasound machine that has uh, echo capabilities called the mine ray. They have two portable um, ultrasound machines, one of which includes echo capabilities. They have one stationary um, x-ray machine, one portable x-ray machine. They did have one CT scanner that was donated back in 2015. It was functional for about a month. Um, and then it has kind of since been a skeleton since then. Um, you can go on to the next slide, please. Um, so radiology needs assessment. Um, so this was kind of the bulk of um, the data going into this project. A pediatric death audit study was performed at KCH, which reviewed data from 2014 to 2015 then demonstrated about 15% of um, patients um, had passed away um, and those patients had a delay of 24 hours or greater in obtaining a potentially treatment altering um, radiology study. And this is for numerous reasons. Um, they did a survey of the attendings at KCH to kind of get more background about this. Some challenges identified by the clinicians um, was there's uh, rotating attending physicians who go through KCH. A lot of the attending physicians there are um, foreign docs. Um, some of them use point of care ultrasound, some do not. There's limited access to formal diagnostic imaging, um, such as CT or ultrasound, and specifically specialty imaging, um, like echocardiography. Um, there's sometimes difficulty in accessibility of the portable ultrasound machines. So like, for example, there were a couple of days when we were there where we didn't actually know where the ultrasound machine was because the person who took it didn't sign it out. And so there were patients who unfortunately weren't able to get um, ultrasound exams for that reason. Um, and another point I wanna make it here is that there's actually no formal sonography training in Malawi. Um, to become a radiographer, there's a two year associate's degree. Um, but to um, learn sonography, the radiographers essentially learn this on the job. So that's in stark contrast to how Americans are trained, which is typically a two to four year ultrasound degree to be able to practice sonography here in the States. So there's a stark contrast um, in Malawi for that. Um, there's no compensation for learning. Um, 
and there's no opportunity for reciprocal exchange or um, visiting when the skill is used. So you can go to the next slide. So to target this, um, there are certain initiatives that Rad Aid um, wants to undertake in Malawi. Um, Rad Aid is a nonprofit radiology organization that's um, whose mission is to improve radiology access across the world. So there's a partnership between Rad Aid, the University of North Carolina Rad Aid chapter, and Kamuzu Central Hospital were started in 2013 after a radiology res readiness assessment was completed. Um, this is a um, validated method that Rad Aid uses to determine how impactful and sustainable their interventions will be at a certain hospital. So the specific goals of Rad Aid for KCH were three goals. One of which is to improve the technical skill of local sonographers. The second is to improve the curriculum for local sonographers. And the third is to improve patient access, um, specifically pediatric access to ultrasound exams. So um, to do this, we identified a cohort of KCH learners who were radiographers who um, designated a certain interest in learning sonography. Um, and the uh, second part of this is to ensure that this intervention is sustainable by making sure the learners that we're teaching are appropriately qualified to pass that knowledge along to future sonographers. So it will essentially um, learn, learn on their own. Um, the partnership between Rad Aid and Malawi Children's Initiative, which is a nonprofit started by a pediatrician in Malawi, um, began in 2019. The first volunteers, uh, which I was part of the cohort, went in August through December of 2019. Um, and while I was there, it was mainly an educational goal, and we focused on utilizing imaging in critically ill patients in the pediatric wards, um, training clinical staff and radiographers in pediatric ultrasound. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of a busy slide, but this is the how we attempted to meet um, goal number one, which is to improve the technical skill of the radiographers. This is a um, kind of a rubric for um, evaluating the local sonographers that Rad Aid used um, at multiple other sites. Um, I just want to highlight on the right side of the screen um, our um, criteria for how we judge um, and evaluate the sonographers performing a cardiac echo. So are they able to consistently obtain views? Are they able to consistently um, identify certain pathology? We evaluated them with a, on a scale of one to five, one being that they weren't really able to demonstrate any knowledge of the view or pathology, five being that they were able to consistently identify a pathology or anatomy section. So the um, box on the upper corner is a self-assessment by one of the radiographers named Hastings. Um, the bottom box is my assessment of Hastings. Um, and there's a difference of about four months in between these two evaluations. And so I wanna highlight there, there are a couple areas where I actually thought that he did better than the evaluation that he gave himself. Um, so we're kind of using this as objective data to show that, you know, this intervention is actually working. Um, and the plan over time is to um, uh, do the assessments at certain intervals to judge if the sonographers themselves are giving um, a better self-evaluation and then to have objective outside evaluators come in and um, show progress that way. Okay, so you know the next slide. This is the, how we attempted to meet the second goal, which was to improve the pediatric um, uh, ultrasound curriculum. Um, as, as I mentioned before, since there is no formal ultrasound training in Malawi, um, these were the visiting uh, radiology residents, attendings, and uh, radiology technicians who went to Malawi um, in the fall of 2019. Um, and we definitely tailored the specific lectures to the local healthcare needs. Um, so we focused a lot on trauma and infectious disease and how we can use point of care ultrasound to um, better evaluate patients. So for example, what I gave a lecture on was schistosomiasis, um, how to tell when you want to use ultrasound or CT, and then some kind of unique point of care ultrasound techniques and identifying skull fractures and optical ultrasound, which includes evaluating for ocular trauma um, and identifying foreign bodies. And I also did a couple um, additional lectures while I was there um, per the request of the local learners. Um, specifically, they had a, an interest in echo. So I um, uh, made those lectures for them as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so the final goal is to improve access for pediatric patients um, in ultrasound. Um, so 
Um, I understand I have about a minute left. So I just wanna highlight here um, the, what I thought made the most difference was building relationships with local clinicians, specifically for pediatric oncology, when they require urgent consultation and for help with image guided biopsies. Um, and also working very closely with the pediatric surgeon who um, would give us feedback on our exams um, as we went through. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a picture of me um, with two of the local learners. On the left is Hastings, um, in the middle is Grace, and on the right is Dr. Choi, who was one of the two attending physicians while we were there. He was a visiting professor from South Korea who was um, what he described as semi-retired. He had held an academic position and is now working full-time in Malawi as a um, attending radiologist. All right, um, so that's it. Just a couple of future directions. Uh, you know, unfortunately, um, COVID kind of torpedoed the immediate um, future directions that we had held, but the goal is to keep sending um, radiologists, radiology residents, and ultrasound technicians to Malawi to um, um, further education and, um, and to manage the evaluations. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks, John. We've got one um, quick question from Senta from the uh, mm -hmm. chat box. And that's just if there's any, who scanned the patients to confirm or check kind of at the sonographers as they were learning, were actually finding the correct findings. Yeah. So um, usually how it worked is the local sonographer would evaluate the patient. And um, I was inside the room with them, giving them direct feedback about how to obtain views um, or to better evaluate pathology. And then um, there were two attending physicians. One was a local Malawian, the other was Dr. Choi, who's in this picture. And they would um, kind of overread those reports just to make sure that there wasn't anything additional. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great. Wonderful, well, thank you everyone. Those are all, all of our presentations. So an enormous thank you to all of our presenters. Um, thank you so much. I think we all learned a lot. I took down lots of notes. I think this is gonna be a nice, moment for everyone to see what you're doing and consider further collaboration. And also, you know, thank you for your flexibility and adaptability and really showing us, you know, all those good global health characteristics, pivoting to the virtual presentation and Zoom. And, and I'm proud and happy to say that you all now have two nice scholarly products, a full poster and a full PowerPoint presentation that you can um, all feel really great about. Um, I want to very quickly thank the judges first because they're going to go break out to talk about the posters. So thank you so much to our judges, Lisa, Naomi, Allison. It's been, um, it's really uh, wonderful to have you support our learners and critique. And I'll let you go because you have some, um, some hard uh, judging to do now. So I want to thank judges, but um more, there are quite a few people to thank. So I'm doing the thank yous here. So some of the very obvious people to thank, you heard throughout the presentations and that's two groups. So that's our partners who have been the teachers and facilitators of learning and hosts and guides, and then the mentors. So we are sort of the space for all the work to happen, but the mentors and the learners and our partners are the ones that do all the work. So you heard all the MAGA mentors mentioned throughout, additional mentors, mentors from our host sites. Um, thank you to all of them. Thank you to the program directors for being supportive and thoughtful for joining, for letting our learners do all of this work and actually championing it for them. Um, and then of course, none of this would happen without our terrific CGHE staff, our moderator um, today, our moderators, I guess, are Sada and Liz. So thank you both for all of the work you did putting this entire thing together and making it happen sort of with, you know, three weeks notice for everybody. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that I want to just say thank you to everyone for the whole global health team uh, for making this happen. Um, and I, I believe now I'll uh, turn it over to Rob um, to maybe uh, give a couple of closing remarks, um, who is, and Dr. 
Rob Murphy is the director of the Institute for Global Health. So he'll join us now just to say a couple of, a couple of things. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ashti. Um, uh, and thank all the presenters who uh, really did a nice job. I actually, <laughs> frankly, I sort of like this, this method a little bit better because you get the opportunity to see the PowerPoint presentation as well as see the poster. And uh, it, uh, it, it really went very well. I'm, I'm so impressed uh, just at how the format came off, but also at the presentations. Uh, presentations were really wonderful. Um, and thank you all so much for your hard work and the great job you're doing. So, um, hey, this is the new format. We better get used to it. Uh, it's amazing, you know, that we have been able to adapt uh, hopefully we can be traveling again soon because <clears throat> I noticed a lot of you uh, just returned just before the shutdown uh, came back. I came back, uh, I was in Nigeria until February 1st and that was the end of all the travel uh, uh, right soon after that. So uh, that's really great. So I think um, the program has gone very well. We don't know when we're going to be traveling again, but we will be. Uh, and, you know, we'll pick up the pieces and in the interim, we're just gonna have to adapt. And uh, this will hopefully get over sooner than later, um, but uh, I, I'm not sure when it's gonna really open up. But uh, I do wanna thank uh, particularly the, uh, the judges. It's a, very difficult, it's a very difficult job to be a judge, especially when you know, the quality is all pretty, it's really yeah. good. So uh, Allison Lofthouse, uh, Lee Saffron, Naomi Sugar, uh, the moderators, uh, who, who you also just uh, um, shouted out, uh, all thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll be hearing from them shortly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, uh, the judges will uh, make a decision and, and we'll send you all an email with... Um, oh, they're going to do it later? Not yeah, because they have so, it's going to take them so long. The presentations yeah. were really too good. That's, you know... Mm -hmm. So, so let me, we'll I just a couple minutes. I, I think uh, I yeah. can tell you some things that are going on uh, internationally, that there's a, a huge initiative to ramp up testing here in the United States, but also internationally that we're involved in here at Northwestern called RADX, R-A-D-X. Uh, it's a $500 million program <clears throat> to develop new like point of care devices. Northwestern actually submitted seven applications uh, into that uh, program, seven, I, I don't know what the total is, but uh, it's well over a hundred uh, applications have gone in. So that's very exciting. It includes our sites in Nigeria, Mali, Tanzania, and South Africa. Um, and then the other thing is the NCI, National Cancer Institute, is launching a, a uh, or creating um, a, a serology COVID research network. And that uh, RFA is coming out uh, next week. And so we're gonna, we're gonna actually try to take the current, our diagnostic network and actually uh, try to also make that our serology network. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things uh, going on uh, in the field now internationally. And uh, <clears throat> I would uh, hope uh, you all have some interest in uh, some of that and maybe you can work on some projects uh, later on. So with that, um, I think that just uh, sort of concludes my comments. I want to thank everybody again and thank Ashley uh, and everybody for putting together and Sarah and Kate and, and Elizabeth for uh, doing the logistics uh, for this whole kind of uh, program. It uh, really came off very well. Thank you very much. It did. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs>